Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for Alessandra for organizing it and the other organizers and for the, um, the possibility to talk to you. I'm very sorry for not being able to be there uh, today by myself because of the weather condition. Um, so I'm going to talk about neuroscience and how we might be able to improve learning and cognition. Um, we're learning throughout our life. So when we are children and we're going to a nursery, we start with a formal uh, education and later on at the university, if we go there, well, you could see that these students are sitting on the grass. They do not exactly study, but they study quite a lot when they are not on the break. And also when we are um, becoming older, we need to learn new skills uh, in order to still adapt to the society. But study is not all the time easy. Uh, there's a lot of people who struggle with learning. Um, if it is people with atypical development, like children, or later on um, when people start to age, if it is typical aging, uh, or in case that they have a stroke or traumatic brain injury and they need to... We try to learn skills. When we try to learn skills, um, we are... Uh, depends on our cognitive abilities. And one of the ways that we also learn is, of course, by training. That can be cognitive training or education, which is, of course, another type of training that takes years. We hope that this process will affect our brain and will cause to neuroplasticity. And with neuroplasticity, this will have um, a mutual influence on learning, while learning will also affect neuroplasticity. Now, one of the ways that you could um, um, see how neuroplasticity will occur and affect learning is, of course, by training. But we know that the existing training uh, are mainly behavioral, they time consuming, and there is little evidence of success. Um, even when we try to teach uh, children at school, some of them will get the material really fast and efficiently, while others will struggle behind. And this is because some neuroplastic processes are not as efficient. One of the ways to accommodate for that and to improve learning is by affecting the brain. And nowadays we have neurotechnology that can allow us to do that non-invasively and improve our uh, learning processes. The technique that I want to um, talk to you about today is called transcranial random noise stimulation. And this is a method which is called transcranial random noise stimulation. We are delivering alternating current using electricity. This is a low voltage, non, uh, well, it is a painless technology that people will uh, not sense it when they receive the stimulation to some degree. You can receive a tingling sensation on your scalp for around 30 seconds, and then you habituate. So it's something that it is not uh, painful, uh, and it seems to be safe when uh, you follow the criteria for uh, your participants. Now, um, one of the ideas how random noise stimulation, why noise in the brain is effective, is that noise, in contrast to what we a lot of time think, is not something bad. Noise at some level, it's actually beneficial. What that I'm showing here on the uh, left side of the screen, What, what that you could see here on the left side of the screen is what happens when we have cells in our brain that need to pass information in our brain, okay? And these cells need to pass a certain threshold, okay? This is the threshold that they need to pass. 
you could see that this signal is too weak. It doesn't reach the threshold to really process the information. If we're going to add to that noise, and this is the noise, yeah, if we add noise to this signal, you could see that it's actually increased the likelihood of these cells to pass the information, or in neuroscientific terminology, it goes to action potentials and neuron to fire. So this is when we add the noise. So noise actually seems to be beneficial, and it's not something new, it's not something that we know only from neuroscience, but in other uh, fields. So I would give you an example from the field of perception, okay, when we think things in the world. I actually, throughout this slide, there is on the left bottom of this slide, there is actually a weak stimulus, okay? There is a stimulus that you could not see as well what it is. And when we will apply to this stimulus on the bottom left side, when we apply to that noise, it's actually going to improve the signal. And you can see it much clearly what it is there. So, you could see it from this example, yeah? When we apply just noise, this is perceptual, at the perceptual level, when we add noise to this picture, you could see how suddenly you're able to see that this is the Big Bang. But you could also see that if we add too much noise, okay, and this is at the, at the end of the, this line of this picture, it's actually not so much beneficial. So too much noise is also not something good. So um, we use with this type of, of method uh, in the last uh, 10 years uh, in research in uh, uh, different types of numerical abilities. We are mainly focused on mathematics, but now we're also looking on other things, uh, such as, for example, fluid intelligence, problem solving. Um, and what did we do in this case? We actually run on participants um, a study when we ask the participants to learn, in this example, drill problem. So they saw the problem that you could see 4 hash 12 equals 17. Over five days, they saw this type of problems and they had to memorize them and learn that by heart. This is to some degree very similar, if you want to think, to how did we uh, learn multiplication problems. So this was a five days of, of training. And when we applied this stimulation to the prefrontal cortex, which is the uh, anterior part of our brain. Um, red is random noise stimulation, and blue is sham stimulation. So sham stimulation is when the participants do not receive real stimulation. This is the placebo condition. And participants could not discriminate if they receive real stimulation or placebo. You could see that the uh, random noise stimulation led to better performance. This is indicates on the y-axis that you could see the reaction times. So people that receive the stimulation become faster with dates. Now, this is one way to learn maths. Another way to learn maths is, of course, by calculation. And we gave the same type of problem, but to, now with calculation that they had to apply an algorithm. You could see here, like the first operand plus the second operand minus 10 plus the second operand, and they had to calculate what would be the right answer in this case. You could see here the reaction times for the calculation problems, they take much longer than the drill problem because it's much more demanding task to calculate rather than uh, remember things. And over the five days, you could see that there was better performance for random noise stimulation than sham stimulation. Now, this is very, we were really excited by these results because it means in, in some case that with stimulation, we were able to improve the learning of both calculation and drill in our participants. At this stage, these were all healthy participants, university students. What that we want to know is if the findings that we have here are long-lasting. 
meaning the participant will go now home. If we will call them after a while, would those who receive the treatment, the real treatment, the random noise stimulation, would still be better than those who receive the placebo condition, the sham condition? So we call our participants six months later, half a year later, and ask them to come back to our lab and give them, again, the same problem and also new problems that they had to apply the same algorithm. And we want to see if there are going to be any long-lasting changes. And for the calculation problem, this is the, the calculation problem, you could see that those who receive the simulation were better than the sham on the problem that they saw six months before. Okay, these are the old problems. But even when we gave them now new problems and they had to apply the same algorithm that they learned six months um, uh, six months before, they were still better than the sham group. So in some case, there are long-lasting effects that were also transferred to new problems. The effects for drill were not long-lasting. So the long-lasting effect we found was only specific for calculation. Now, um, when we uh, applying uh, cognitive training or when we teach uh, students, there are two measures that we usually looked at, but we sometimes do not differentiate between them. One is performance, which is the fluctuation in their, um, in their behavior during the period that they actually um, engage with the material. Okay, so this is, for example, if a student sits in class and you teach them a multiplication and they answer it while they are in class. This is, of course, an important aspect, but the more important aspect is not performance, but learning. Learning is what happened between the times that they were actually engaged with the, uh, with the task itself. So this is what we call a lot of time consolidation or retention. So how much people really remember once they finished the class, went home, coming back the next day, and need to do things that they learned the day before or a week before. This is what we really want to give to our students. We want them to remember the material. We don't want them just to perform well in the class when they are in when we are teaching them or just perform well in an exam. We want them actually to remember these things later on. So we examine what's the effect of the stimulation in terms of learning or in terms of performance. And what that we found is that the effect of the stimulation is actually on the learning, okay? Learning seems to be facilitated, seems better when we stimulate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, okay? And this is compared to sham, okay? So zero is indicating basically the sham. This is a regression analysis. We have sham as a reference uh, variable in this case. But the, the other very interesting uh, point is that if you stimulate the wrong region, this is the parietal cortex, which is in the posterior part of the brain. Can you see There's suddenly a blank? Yeah. If we're stimulating the parietal cortex, it actually leads people to remember less, okay? They becoming worse in their performance. So, it's to some degree suggests that you need to know also where to stimulate. And if you stimulate the wrong region, you actually can cause impairment rather than improvement as in this case. Now, uh, the um, other thing that we want to examine, and this is starting with a more trend nowadays, to have uh, a more personalized intervention. So we a lot of time looking on a group level what happened to all of the people together. But some people react better, some people react worse. And uh, we would like to tailor our interventions in order to fit those who would benefit the most and maybe to adapt it differently to those who would not. So this is the first stage, a very small scale uh, sample size of, of uh, our attempt. Uh, in this case, uh, we base our hypothesis on the link between the anterior part of the brain, 
that is involved exactly when we're starting to learn things and the more posterior part of the brain that it is once we consolidate the information and, and the information is no longer new. And what that we looked here is on the strength of the connectivity between those two parts, okay? So this is when you put people inside an MR scanner and you see how um, the uh, link between those regions based on the board signal, uh, how strong it is. And you can basically have a measure which we call functional connectivity measure. So here on this scale, you have functional connectivity measures with lower values on this end, higher value on this end. So this value on this side indicates that the connections between those parts seems to be weaker. And these values indicates there is a stronger connection between them. You see here the random noise stimulation and you see the sham group. And what you could see is that the stimulation was beneficial. Lower values indicates better performance. The effect of stimulation was especially for those with lower functional connectivity rather than strong functional connectivity. So if you compare those to sham, you could see that the effect was mainly for those that had weaker connectivity in this case, indicating that stimulation might be beneficial, especially for those with weaker functional connectivity. Now, uh, this view is also fits with the idea of stochastic resonance that I talked at the beginning of the lecture, because here we would assume that people will have a weaker uh, communication between uh, a weaker communication between those both regions, and this is where noise would actually be beneficial. So to test it further, we went to a population that have a weaker connectivity between the frontal and parietal, and these are people with um, learning disabilities in maths. So we went to a school, this is a special school uh, in London for specific learning difficulties, and we team up with them and uh, tested uh, children there that fits the selection criteria on a game that we designed. And I would not have the time to now expand on the game, uh, but this is a game that uh, involves uh, numerical understanding, embodiment, and visual special abilities. And while they did that, we used a wireless stimulator to stimulate their dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex over nine days of uh, training. The nine days were over one month, uh, twice a week, uh, for uh, four weeks. Now, uh, the first finding was that those who received the stimulation in red compared to the sham start to improve better, you could see it here, compared to sham stimulation. So sham stimulation that did not show uh, improvement in their uh, game, which is indicated by error, so how much they were close in their response to the right answer. Uh, you could see that the effect starts to be on the sixth day, but you could also see that it's starting to be smaller with time. The question is, why is that? Um, one of the possibilities is that those in the uh, group received the stimulation, because they were better, they were more accurate, they reached more difficult problems during the training, because this was an adaptive training. Uh, we examined that, and, and this is uh, indeed what that we found. Uh, you see here, this is the uh, number of sessions, nine sessions. Uh, this is the level completed, so um, higher values indicate uh, more difficult problems. You could see that those who received the stimulation show the steeper learning curve compared to the sham. And the steeper learning curves is actually what we've found in previous studies, the study that I showed you earlier about the drill, calcul the drill and calculation learning, but also in other studies that we did, and also, but also um, um, other groups uh, did. This is a group that's run on perceptual learning, uh, a group from Italy. So this is very encouraging because it seems that uh, similar to what we find in healthy adults, the effect of stimulation might have similar effect in children with learning difficulties. Um, 
So um, I would like to conclude that uh, stimulation uh, seems to improve uh, consolidation and retention of uh, memory. Uh, the effect seems to depend on individual uh, uh, neural correlates uh, in this case. In this case, the relationship between the frontal, frontal and parietal cortices. Um, and this is just the first step. We have a lot of work to still do, but we hope that this step uh, would lead to uh, better interventions in the future to improve those with uh, learning difficulties. Um, I would like to thank my collaborators and uh, previous and current club members, uh, funding bodies that support this work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.